Welcome to Planttopia. I'm your host, David Godori, and I'm a plant pathologist at Cornell University. Any listeners who have never met a real live plant pathologist can be forgiven. We are a very low visibility, but very high impact profession. We protect the world's food supply from disease causing fungi, bacteria, viruses, and nematodes, all of which want to eat your lunch. This time on Planttopia. By increasing beneficial microbes in, around the, the, the rhizosphere of these plants, they were able to help protect the plant from diseases. Some might think a dog is man's best friend. Perhaps so, but who among all the creatures that walk, crawl, or swim on the earth is the best friend of plants? What would Charles Darwin say? Charles Darwin was just fascinated with how they did this, and he was so intrigued with that. They say that he was uh, he would spend time around the, the monolithic site called Stonehenge, just sitting there watching these earthworms pull organic matter into these holes. Today, we're going to spend some time with a spokesperson for the perhaps unglamorous, but not unlikable earthworm, and learn just how important earthworms are in the health of soils that grow some of our most important crops. We'll see why we should thank them for not leaving us neck deep in leaf litter, and the vital role that they play in protecting our food supply from a broad array of microbial plant pathogens. That's today on Plantopia. Hi, I'm, I'm Wade Elmer, and I'm a plant pathologist at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. I'm accustomed to handling worms because I, I go fishing a lot, um, but a lot of people just don't consider them to be very touchable or user-friendly. And yet it turns out that they're very important in the health of soils and in the health of plants. That's absolutely right. Actually, Charles Darwin, uh, his first publication in 1838 and his last publication 50 years later in 1888 were on earthworms, and he was fascinated with them. He actually made a, a statement that it may be doubted whether there are many other animals which have played so important a part in the history of the world as these lowly organized creatures. So it's a, there's a long history of working on earthworms. And all of this is occurring under the surface. Uh, out of sight. And so we might be forgiven for not understanding it. But what are the worms doing down there? Well, earthworms are fascinating. There's actually three different types. There's there's the type that we call aeneic. Now, those are the ones that you are using for fishing, and those are the night crawlers that are so common. There's another earthworm type called endogeic, and we really don't know a lot about them, but they kind of travel within the first foot of soil. And they don't really, uh, we don't really know a great deal about their ecology. And then the group called epigeic are the red wigglers that you see in your compost bin. And so they all have different functions, but basically they all are just consuming plant material and, and, and breaking it down into very positive uh, organic matter that's very beneficial for plants. So if that's what they're doing, what would happen if they were absent? What would soils look like without earthworms? Well, that's a, that's a good question. There are other organisms, animals, springtails, and certainly all the bacteria and so forth that would help break these things down. But they are, they're the ultimate plowers. They aerate soil. They bring organic matter from the top down into the lower regions where it can be broken down and decayed. So in their absence, we'd, we'd see a different type of uh, uh of structure. I mean, the horizons in, in an agricultural soil, the, the different layers of the soil, the A, the B, and the C horizons, would probably be uh, much more pronounced and there'd be less mixing among them. So I've worked in a couple of different uh, crop systems, apples and grapes, where fungal pathogens on the leaves are very important. Uh, they, they overwinter on the fallen leaves. But in many orchards and vineyards, leaf litter survival over winter is, is almost negligible because earthworms somehow drag these leaves into their burrows. And all that's left in the spring are these little tufts of leaf petioles sticking out of the earthworm burrow. 
How do the worms do that? That's interesting. They have a way of grasping it with their the 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 the, the head of the earthworm, and they will actually kind of pull it in, and they slowly just it coils up, and you could sit there for hours and watch this happen. It's really an amazing thing, and I, I should mention that Charles Darwin was just fascinated with how they did this, and he was so intrigued with that. They say that he was uh, he would spend time around the the monolithic site called Stonehenge, just sitting there watching these earthworms pull organic matter into these holes. And they're doing this during the evening as well, or primarily during the evening. Primarily during the evening, because of predation and uh, by by birds and so forth. Are they doing something beneficial to the soil while they're doing this? Are they in some way aerating the soil? Certainly, they are opening up big burrows. In fact, many of these, the night crawlers that, uh, that we call Lumbricus terrestris, that's the, that's the European night crawler, they will open up large burrows that r- roots from, from plants will rapidly uh, colonize because there, there's less you know, ob- uh, physical obstruction. To going down, these uh, burrows can go almost a meter deep. So these earthworms are very effective in breaking up hard pans and aerating soils that um, are, you know, can quickly be flooded. I've seen devices on golf courses that are essentially rolls of spikes that are driven into the soil as they're pulled behind a piece of equipment. Uh, this is done for aeration. Is this the same thing that the earthworms are doing for free? Exactly. But ironically, on golf courses, earthworms are probably not a very good thing to have around because they, they tend to uh, leave their little casting piles, their burrows on the top part of the greens, and they can be very disfiguring. So uh, earthworms are usually collected off of tops of these uh, greens in the morning and then sold to fishing supply companies. So what else are the worms doing to benefit the soil, uh, they're aerating the soil and they're returning organic matter as a constituent of the soil. But is there more? Certainly. One of the most amazing things about earthworms is that they are they actually will um, ingest the material and all of the bacteria in their gut usually gets packaged into their castings. So when they're, they're, their castings, which you can see uh, after in, – in, on you know, after a, uh, in the morning and so forth, they're actually little balls and they've been coated with a mucilaginous coating that's very, very high in calcium. That's why earthworms really need to be in soils that have been limed. They usually like that. And this, this actually, this mucilaginous coating is actually prevents the casting from drying out. So there, these castings can actually have high levels of beneficial bacteria, the fluorescent pseudomonads, bacilli, things that are in very, very important in plant health are in high densities in these castings. So as they feed, they are actually transforming the microbial structure in these, in these uh, burrows. So if we consider these to be rather important organisms that are beneficial uh, in agriculture. What can we do to preserve their populations? Well, there are things we can do that will increase the densities of earthworms. Liming is very important. As I mentioned, um, they do need calcium in order to uh, create that mucilaginous casting uh, coating. So uh, liming the fields uh, will uh, certainly favor earthworms. They do not thrive in acid soils. Uh, cover crops, because the one thing cover crops do is they provide the, the food that they need or, or to survive. Uh, bare ground is very uh, um, damaging to earthworm populations. And so mulching is also another way of provide, providing a food uh, reserve for the, the earthworms. Providing manure is something that it really increases earth, earthworm populations. And also avoiding tillage as much as you can. Because whenever you go through the field with a plow or a shovel or a hoe, you are destroying those burrows and those plants and, and those earthworms have to then reestablish those burrows, which can exhaust their energy reserves. Are there fungicides and insecticides that are less harmful to earthworms? So there might be some potential to develop an earthworm-friendly IPM program? 
So far, I'm not aware of any pesticide that could be used safely in earthworms. Generally, uh, rock salts, uh, pesticides, fertilizers, anything like that tends to be deleterious to the earthworm populations. They do seem to bounce back fairly quickly, but I don't believe there's anything out there that I, I know of at present that could be considered earthworm friendly. Plantopia is brought to you by the American Phytopathological Society, or APS, to honor the United Nations celebration of 2020 as the International Year of Plant Health. Healthy plants can help us solve world hunger, stabilize the world's climate, protect our forests, and add beauty to our lives. Conviron is the world leader in controlled environment systems for plant science research. Convirin's reach-in plant growth chambers, walk-in rooms, and Argus control systems provide precise, uniform, and repeatable control of temperature, light, humidity, CO2, and other environmental conditions. Applications include plant growth, entomology, tissue culture, germination, and other research where tight environmental controls are required. Learn more at Convirin.com or contact us at info at Convirin.com. Now, back to the show. Wade, most people don't start off in their careers uh, thinking that they're going to end up studying earthworms, with the possible e- exception of Charles Darwin. What was it that attracted you to this area of study? Well, I've always been interested in soil borne diseases, and I was studying a disease of basil that uh, was um, a real problem in many of the plantings around here in Connecticut, mostly in backyard gardens. And people were asking me, what should I rotate with? And so I was doing studies with different rotation crops. And I noticed that in the field, I was finding that when I rotated with rye and clover, I was getting a a real reduction in disease. So there was something about that. When I went into the greenhouse and tried that in, in soil in pots with potting soil, I didn't see that response. So I thought there must be something out there in the field that was happening. And when I went out there, I noticed that those rye clover plots had an an abundance of earthworm activity. So that was my first hint that maybe the earthworms were doing something to the rye and clover residues that was making the soil more suppressive to the disease. So it's not a case of the earthworms simply burying a plant pathogen, but they're actually changing the soil environment to make it less favorable for a pathogen. That's correct. I've done studies in the greenhouse where I cultured earthworms in pots and then analyzed the rhizosphere soil off of different vegetable plants. And I found that the bacterial populations were like 10 times higher when there was earthworm activity. So I really think that was a contributing factor by increasing beneficial microbes around the, the, the rhizosphere of these plants. They were able to help protect the plant from diseases. Has this information had an impact on tillage practices, or are growers uh, still sort of making decisions between uh, practices that will preserve the earthworm population, but at the end of the day, they still have to till the field? There's a lot of programs right now in pumpkin culture where they're actually using rye as a cover crop, and then they're rolling it. And the growers have noticed that the soil, the the quality of the soil is much higher than when they go to another system like, um, let's say, strawberries, which is very chemical dependent and so forth. And they would uh, they would not see the earthworm densities there. So this is a situation where they have to rotate between these two crops, but they notice that when they go into the rye cover crop, they are they're seeing this benefit of this increased earthworm population. So is that because the crop is rolled and then the earthworms actually incorporate the plant material into the soil? I, I think of the way a green manure crop is, is normally used is that it, it's grown and then it's plowed under. Right. I think um, whether it's plowed under or whether it's just rolled and died on there, it's still an available food source for the um, the earthworm. Um, I should m- point out that earthworms are getting the majority of their nutrition not from the plant material, but from the bacteria and the fungi which grow on the on these on the plant material. 
And that's why they like to pull these leaves down into their burrows so they will start to rot and get uh, coated with bacteria and fungi, and then they can consume them. So in a sense, they're farming bacteria. Exactly. So, Wade, for my home garden, what should I be doing to preserve the earthworm population so that the benefits will accrue to me through their activities? The two most important things that I suggest homeowners do who want to increase the soil health and their earthworm populations is to put their leaf mold onto their gardens and lime it. Just those two simple things, leaf mold and lime will bring on the earthworm populations, and you'll be um, amazed at how many earthworms there'll be at the end of the season. So instead of collecting all of my leaves and bagging them and putting them on the curb for the city to haul away, I could simply spread them on the surface of my garden and apply a a thin coating of lime and, and let the worms take care of them. That would be the best thing I think you could do. Would it be beneficial to mulch the leaves beforehand, uh, to chop them, or should we simply broadcast them on the surface? Uh, I think chopping them would be probably slightly better just because you'd increase the surface area available to the earthworms and then your populations could increase proportionately. I actually pile all of my leaves into onto plastic sheets and just let them sit in the corner of the yard. In fact, I just rake onto those leaves and then I just drag those plastic um you know those the, the plastic onto the garden and, and just dump it in the spring and then wrote and then I I usually just kind of rototill it in briefly and then lime and then let it go. Is there any possibility of stocking earthworms in the soil? Is is such a thing possible? Yes, there are ways of of extracting earthworms from areas where you think there may be high levels. There's you can actually use a suspension of of mustard. Uh, spice, you know, mustard flour. You uh, can make up a, like a 10% uh, mustard powder ex- a solution, and you can pour that onto an area of soil, and you'll be very surprised. Within minutes, you'll see the earthworms emerging from their burrows. Now, they're, this is kind of irritating them, so you do need to pick them up and wash them off, but you can extract very high levels of earthworms very quickly this way, and then you could then throw them onto your garden if you were trying to increase the densities that way. So I have a brother who lives in Montana, and I know near him is, of all things, an earthworm ranch. So in addition to ranching cattle out there, they actually ranch earthworms. That's interesting. I I wonder what type of earthworms they are. There are many places that produce the red wigglers for sale if you wanted to, you know, spike a new compost bin with um, some red wigglers. You could actually purchase them. Uh, a lot of people are also producing the worms um, for, uh, and, and this is surprising, but actually for food consumption, you could extract actually protein from these worms. And that's being used and explored in various, co- not so much in the United States, but in other places. So I'd be interested in knowing what, what species of worms he's interested in producing, because that, that, that would depend what the market is. Another was uh, an operation in New York that was actually using earthworms to process uh, animal manures from from dairy operations, where they were converting the manure into a compost, a, a vermiform compost. Exactly. This is a very popular area where people, and you can actually buy bags of vermicost compost in these garden centers. It's very, it's it's yeah, you know, it's pretty, it's a pretty high end product if you think about it. But um, it's actually um, these worm uh, composting bins are set up, and then the castings from the worms fall down below, and they're bagged up and sell and sold because they're very very high in, like I said, beneficial bacteria and lots of other nutrients that have been extracted as as they go through the gut of an earth. If earthworms can consume the tissue on which a pathogen overwinters, or they can consume the pathogen itself, or they can alter the environment to make it so unfavorable that the disease does not develop. Are there examples of agricultural systems where this is being used? I have actually shown in experimental field plots that applying earthworms around the base of eggplants would suppress a disease of eggplants called verticillium wilt. 
And I saw this in several years doing different types of studies, and I saw it in the greenhouse as well. And I presumably, I think the mechanism there is that it was just, again, increasing the soil health, improving the microbial population around these around the roots of the plants and actually favoring health that way. I've also seen that with tomato plants, where um, I've actually went out and I put in plastic coatings and, and made these little corrals where, all, where the earthworms would presumably not be able to crawl out. And I would put earthworms in an area and I would get improved growth. One area or one system where I saw no benefit was in asparagus. Apparently, the residues of asparagus plants contain considerable toxins, and the earthworms would not survive well in that system. For more information about the International Year of Plant Health, visit us at plantopiapodcast.org. Thanks for listening. Our show is produced by John Bryce. Thanks also to Mark Gleason, Jim Bradeen, Laura Isles, and Roshni Karate. I'm your host, David Godori, and you've been listening to Plantopia. Plantopia.